Madam President, I want to begin by welcoming our newest senator from the state of Nebraska, Pete Ricketts. Uh, I don't know him well. I'm sure I will come to know him. But I certainly know his family. They have made their impression on the city of Chicago by purchasing the historic franchise, the Chicago Cubs. They've made major investments in the city of Chicago and state of Illinois in that pursuit. And best of all, they've virtually guarantee that Wrigley Field is going to stay in Wrigley Field, exactly where it should be. It's one of the cathedrals of baseball in America, and the Ricketts family has made a commitment to it, which is uh, certainly satisfying to devout baseball fans like myself. I hope that the time of the new senators will be productive and gratifying. The work in this body can sometimes be slow and frustrating, but with patience, good things can happen. Madam President, four years ago today, as another new Congress was starting its work, America was nearing the end of the longest federal government shutdown in history. It was day 33 of a 35-day shutdown, a shutdown that was precipitated by President Donald Trump when he refused to sign any budget that did not include billions of dollars for what he wanted to build and called his, quote, big, beautiful wall on the southern border. That dysfunction and that government shutdown cost our economy billions of dollars, and it shook the confidence of many in this country and its future, in America's ability to do the basics. Fast forward to the start of the last Congress two years ago. The three newest members of the Senate had just been sworn in, giving America only the second 50-50 Senate split in its history. It was a time of crises and division the deadliest public health emergency in a century, the gravest financial crisis since the Great Depression, and then, and then, a violent attack on the Capitol by an insurrectionist mob, one of the darkest days in the history of this building in our nation. The doubters said that a 50-50 Senate coming into being with that circumstance was destined to be gridlocked. Madam President, we proved them wrong. Today we begin the legislative work of a new Congress, the 118th Congress. Will these two years, the next two years, be remembered for dysfunction or democracy? Chaos, chaos or consensus? That really is the challenge we face. The choice is not entirely in our hands here in the Senate with a 51-49 slim majority. The new MAGA majority in the House of Representatives has promised endless investigations, confrontations, impeachments, and chaos. But it doesn't have to be that way. The Senate can be a steadying force. We can pass a budget. We can give a helping hand to families and businesses. We can invest in a better future. We can defend democracy against the rise of autocracy. We can pay our nation's bills if we're willing to work together for the common good. If you want to see our choices, look at what we faced on January 4th, just a few weeks ago. On that day, the House of Representatives was in chaos. A small band of mega hardliners held the House hostage to their extreme demands. In the end, it took 15 roll call votes, over four days to elect a new speaker, who will be, after all his concessions to the extreme wing of his party, on paper perhaps the weakest speaker in recent memory. However, on that same day, January 4th, President, Bud, President Biden and the Republican leader, Senator McConnell, were together at a major bridge that connects Covington, Covington, Kentucky with Cincinnati, Ohio. It's a bridge that's needed repair for years. And now those repairs will happen because of the historic infrastructure bill passed by the last Congress the largest infrastructure plan since Eisenhower administration in the 1950s and the creation of the interstate highway system. That bipartisan infrastructure plan will rebuild bridges and roads all across America and our state of Illinois. We've already seen evidence of that. It'll expand affordable high-speed broadband services and it will build the 21st century infrastructure America needs to remain strongest in the world. It's already creating good jobs in Illinois and around the nation, and it will continue to do so. That's just one of the achievements of this Congress that had a 50-50 Senate. 
We also passed the Chips and Science Act to supercharge America's microchip industry and bring high-tech manufacturing back to America. We passed the boldest economic recovery and investment plan since President Franklin Roosevelt. The most sweeping legislation enacted by any government on earth to confront the climate crisis. And the Bipartisan Pact Act to help millions of veterans who were exposed to burn pits and other toxic chemicals during their military service. We capped the price of insulin for seniors at $35 a month, and now for the first time ever, Medicare can negotiate on prescription drug prices, and Medicare recipients' out-of-pocket expenses for drugs will be capped at $2,000 a year. In the last Congress, we confirmed 97 outstanding new Article III judges, including the first black woman ever to serve on the Supreme Court, Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson. These new justices will bring unprecedented diversity to our federal courts, both in terms of demographics as well as their backgrounds and professional experience. In the last Congress, with President Biden's leadership and the support of Congress, the United States rallied the free world to confront Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Yesterday, I was at a meeting in an area known as Ukrainian Village in the city of Chicago. It was a gathering not only of proud Lithuanians who were determined to do everything they could to help their friends and relatives back in Ukraine fight off Putin's invasion, but also a lot of others. There were many Polish people there, Lithuanians as well, and many other consular generals were present to express their support for the common cause. I am proud that the United States is leading this effort. We must continue to. And when I hear suspicions and rumors and suggestions that maybe the MAGA Republicans in the House have grown weary of this war and impatient for it to end, I have to remind them, freedom is worth fighting for. The Ukrainians are dying for it. We need to stand by them with the NATO alliance and see this through and put an end to Putin's terrible war crimes. We ensured as well that the United States will not be a safe haven for the perpetrators of heinous war crimes in Ukraine. We'll continue to stand with the Ukrainians until Putin's illegal war is over and Ukraine is once again free and at peace. We authorized and strengthened the Violence Against Women Act, passed new laws to strengthen protections for survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, child sexual abuse, and sexual harassment. Over the last two years, the federal government delivered 700 million COVID shots for free. Two years, 700 million vaccinations. And according to the White House, COVID deaths in America are down by 80%. America's economy created 11 million jobs, the strongest job creation in the history of our nation. The nation's unemployment rate is near a 50-year low. Gas prices are headed down, and inflation is finally easing a little bit. All of that happened with a 50-50 Senate. That's not gridlock. That's government working for the common good. Priorities for this Congress are pretty obvious. We need to continue our efforts to protect basic rights of Americans. As well as voting rights, we need to include in that list reproductive health rights for the women of America. We are determined to end the crisis on our southern border by securing the border, finally fixing our broken immigration system, and passing the DREAM Act, my ambition for almost two decades. Well, longer than that, to be honest with you. Over the last week, I visited with some of the migrants who were bused into Chicago and talked to them about their families and what they face. If there's anyone who thinks that they are trying to come game the system in America, they ought to talk to them. They're ready to go to work and we need to make sure that that is done in a proper fashion. Last year, we passed the most significant gun safety law in nearly 30 years. But the horrific shooting that killed 11, now the latest number is 11, and wounded nine more this past weekend at the Lunar New Year celebration in Monterey Park, California, is another terrible reminder that more work needs to be done for gun safety. The Lunar New Year shooting was the 33rd mass shooting in America so far this month, 33 so far this month. Last year, there were 600 mass shootings. I remember one of them well, and I'm sure the presiding officer does too. A gunman opened fire on a 4th of July parade in Highland Park, Illinois. He, did, he charged, discharged 83 rounds, 
in less than a minute. Killed seven people, injured dozens more. 19 little children and two of their teachers were murdered in their classroom in Uvalde, Texas just days before. 10 people were killed in a grocery store in Buffalo, New York in a racist attack. The list goes on and on and on. It's madness. It's sickening. It is a uniquely American problem. Try to explain it away, you can't. There are just too darn many guns in the hands of the wrong people. And they continue to produce them and sell them with abandon and without any sense of responsibility for the results. Madam President, we must pay our nation's bills. We all agree with that. Using the death ceiling as a bargaining uh, chip to force deep cuts in Social Security and Medicare is unacceptable. Pushing through other extreme changes that can't pass on their own merits ought to be unthinkable. Yet this is what the mega extremists in the House appear hell-bent on doing. I would remind those who want to pose for holy pictures as budget balancers that one-fourth, almost one-fourth of our entire national debt accumulated in the United States over the last 230 years was racked up during the four years that Donald Trump was in the White House. Almost one-fourth of our national debt. What we're doing with the debt ceiling now is paying for Donald Trump's priorities voted for by Congress and many Republicans. It's the responsible thing to do. Even when there are policies such as tax breaks for the wealthiest people in the country, the fact is it was enacted into law. And we have a responsibility to preserve the good faith and credit of the United States to extend the debt limit, even for those policies which I personally disagreed with. Republicans moved to raise the debt ceiling three times during the Trump administration. Democrats supported them every time. We don't want to turn America into a deadbeat nation. Defaulting on our, on our national debt for the first time in history, as the MAGA Republicans are threatening in the House, would throw millions of Americans out of work. And according to a think tank, the third way, a worker with a 401k retirement account could lose $20,000 because of interest rates. A new 30-year mortgage would cost an additional $130,000. How many people would be willing to buy a new home or a new car facing those circumstances? Borrowing would become harder and more expensive, and the national debt would increase by $850 million just for our failure to extend the debt limit. Abraham Lincoln once said, we cannot escape history, warning Congress and a nation torn apart by a civil war. Thank God we're not facing anything like that today. But we are facing deep divisions and continued assaults on our democracy. And so as we begin this new Congress, we need to ask ourselves, what do we want history to say about this Senate during the next two years? Will we be remembered for chaos or consensus? Will we work to heal the divisions of our nation or deepen them? Will we solve the problems that really matter to the American people or invest, invent problems and stoke them for political advantage? My Democratic colleagues and I are hopeful that it will be a positive answer to those questions, that we can negotiate and work together in good faith for a better America. And I yield the floor.